This is the tutorial for the Star Clusters Lab. This lab lets you work with some real astronomical data to study a cluster of stars in our galaxy. You'll see how we can put together an HR diagram for a cluster and use that to measure its distance and age. A star cluster is a group of hundreds to hundreds of thousands of stars that are all held together by their mutual gravity. The closest ones can be seen in the sky with the naked eye, while farther ones show up as fuzzy blobs in small telescopes. Clusters come in two major types, open and globular. The open ones are smaller and more loosely held together. They tend to have hundreds to thousands of stars. Globular clusters are much larger, with some approaching a million stars and they form a tightly bound ball of stars. All of the stars in a star cluster are roughly the same distance away from us. So when we compare the stars within a cluster, we know that the differences in brightness are based solely on the luminosities of the stars, not differences in distance. Also, the stars in a star cluster are all the same age. As a result, a star cluster acts as a laboratory where we can see how a whole population of stars evolves together. In fact, the first HR diagrams were put together for star clusters. Astronomers have been recording data on stars and other astronomical objects for hundreds of years. And a few decades ago, it became clear that they needed some way to gather all of that information and make it accessible. As a result, the Centre de Données Astronomiques de Strasbourg set up an online clearinghouse for astronomical data, known as SIMBAD. This is where astronomers now look first to find out what is known about stars, star clusters, galaxies, and a huge range of other types of objects in space. In this lab, we'll be using SIMBAD data on clusters of stars in our galaxy. At the start of the lab, you'll be given access to a spreadsheet file with data on each of the observed stars in a cluster. In particular, you'll work with the color and brightness information on these stars. When astronomers measure the brightness of stars, they often do so using filters that only let certain colors of light through. The most common color filters used are from the UBVRI system, where each letter refers to the light of a particular set of wavelengths or colors. So U means near ultraviolet. B is blue. V is the center of the visible spectrum, effectively yellow. R is red. And I is near infrared. We can look at any one of these colors to get a sense of how bright a star is, though the most common one used for this is the V filter. However, if we combine the data from two of these filters, that tells us not just how bright the star is, but also its overall color and hence temperature. For example, if we had subtract the star's magnitude in the B filter from the V filter, then we're effectively comparing how much brighter it is in one part of the spectrum than another. If it's brighter in B than in V, then it's a bluer star. However, Remember that the magnitude system runs backwards, so brighter magnitudes have lower numbers. Keep that in mind when you answer question one in the lab. The first step in this lab is to download the spreadsheet. The data is given in both Google Sheets and Microsoft Excel formats. These instructions will be set up for Excel but you are welcome to use any spreadsheet program you're comfortable with. Your instructor will have more information on how you'll be given access to the data files and how you select which cluster you'll be working on. Once you open up the spreadsheet, look at the data columns labeled MAGB and MAGV, the B and V filter magnitudes. Each line in the spreadsheet is a different star in the cluster. Later, we'll be creating an HR diagram for these clusters. And one thing you might remember about the HR diagram is that the magnitudes get smaller as you get higher on the graph. 
This comes from the fact that smaller magnitudes represent higher luminosity stars. Unfortunately, some versions of these spreadsheets don't plot the numbers getting smaller upward. So the instructions were written so that the V magnitudes are reversed. If you have a spreadsheet that can be set to plot smaller numbers higher on the graph, you're welcome to ignore this change, but you'll want to be careful that you handle the math correctly. The first step in the instructions is to look for any rows that are missing either the V or V magnitudes. If there are any, then cut and paste those rows down to the bottom of the file. Then you insert a new column called minus V mag. As the name suggests, this will be the negative of the V magnitudes. Note that you may have to put the title in quotation marks to avoid an error. You don't have to type in all the values in the column yourself. Instead, set up the function in the first cell below the header and type in the equation. Start with the equal sign, then the minus sign, and finally, the cell reference for the first V magnitude. Once you've done one, you can carry the calculation down the row. In Excel, you grab the dot in the corner and pull it down. Next, insert a new column before minus V and call that B minus V. Then calculate it in a similar way to the previous one. Use the equal sign, then type in the cell reference for the first B magnitude, then a minus sign, and finally the cell reference for the first V magnitude. Once you've defined that formula, you can carry it down the rows just like the minus V magnitudes. The next step is to insert another new column, this one right after minus V mag. We'll call this one minus V abs. This will be for the absolute magnitudes from table two in the lab. Then you should insert 12 new rows at the top of the spreadsheet, just below the column headers. In the B minus V and minus V abs columns in these new rows, fill in the relevant data from table two. Note that there won't be anything in the minus V column for this data. And the minus V abs column will be blank in all the rows below it. The absolute magnitude data is a set of standard values astronomers have observed for main sequence stars of each color. By adding these to the table, it will create a separate set of points just for the absolute magnitudes on your HR diagram. When you create the diagram, you should see these points in a different color than the rest, and we'll be able to use this to find the distance to the cluster. Now it's time to create a scatter plot of your data. Start by selecting all three of the columns we've created, B minus V, minus V, and minus V abs, and include everything except the header rows and any rows that didn't have a B or V magnitude on the bottom. That means that some of the cells you're selecting will be blank. That's okay. Create a scatter plot using the spreadsheet's plotting function. Note that you don't want a plot that connects the dots. Label the axes on the chart with minus V and B minus V. You see two different sets of points on the graph. Most of the points will be the stars in the cluster but there should be a dozen in a different color. Those ones are the absolute magnitude points from table two. Let's start by just focusing on the cluster stars. Notice that they make a pattern that is vaguely like the HR diagrams we've seen, though it's probably a much messier graph than the ones you've seen in the lecture part of the course. Real data tends to be like that. Nonetheless, there should be a concentration of stars making up the main sequence. There may also be stars in other regions of the diagram, including some located roughly where the red giants and maybe even white dwarfs should be. Note that if you're not seeing a pattern like this, you should contact your instructor and show them your spreadsheet and graph. It may be that there is a minor error cropping up that is preventing the graph from plotting properly and you can save a lot of time by working with your instructor to fix that before you try going ahead with the rest of the lab. 
One thing to remember about this star cluster data is that it may be missing the stars from the top and bottom parts of the HR diagram. The stars at the top of the diagram evolve fastest, so depending on the age of the cluster, there may not be any of those stars left. The stars at the bottom are very faint, so may not have been captured in any of the surveys of the cluster. Try drawing your own rough sketch of the graph. In the sketch, label things like the main sequence and the set of stars that mark out the absolute magnitudes. In the next step, we're going to start working on an estimate of how far away this cluster is. We can do this by comparing the cluster stars to the absolute magnitude data. Remember that absolute magnitude is defined as the magnitude a star would have if it were 10 parsecs, or 32.6 light years away. So if your cluster were 32.6 light years away, the main sequence of the cluster would line up on top of the absolute magnitude points. However, all of these clusters are more than 32.6 light years away, so the stars look fainter than their absolute magnitudes and appear lower on the diagram. We can use this difference in magnitudes to calculate how far away the cluster is. One thing that helps with this is that even though a more distant star will be fainter than a closer one, the color doesn't change with distance. That means that stars in the cluster have the same colors as the absolute magnitude points directly above them. So you should compare the absolute magnitudes to the apparent magnitudes of the stars below them. Find the minus V magnitude for the center of the main sequence around the same color values as we have listed for the absolute magnitudes and put these in table 3. There will always be some scattering of points around the center. You don't have to find a single star with the exact same color as is listed in the absolute magnitude table. Just take the average of the stars in that area. You'll probably find that some of the absolute magnitude points extend out to either side of the cluster main sequence. As we said before, the brightest and faintest stars are not going to be in this data, either because they aren't in the cluster or they're too faint to show up. So you don't need to fill in data for any lines that you don't have. Once you've found minus V, calculate V minus V abs and put your answer in table 3. This is known as the distance modulus and it's the key number in figuring out the distance to the cluster. Remember that the diagram has everything multiplied by minus 1. So if you're getting a negative number for the difference, just multiply by minus 1 again. Once you have a set of values for V minus V abs, the distance modulus, calculate the average of these and put that at the bottom of table 3. Once you've found the distance modulus, you can use this to find the actual distance to the cluster. Use the second equation in this section of the lab. This is a variation on the magnitude distance formula we've used in the lecture. Put in the average distance modulus for V minus V abs. Calculate the fraction in the exponent, then use the 10 to the x key and multiply the result by 3.26 to turn the distance into light years. In addition to finding the best estimate of the distance, the lab also asks you to estimate the range of possible distances. Subtract the smallest from the largest values of V minus V abs in table 3, and then divide the result by 2 to get the uncertainty in the distance modulus. Then calculate the distance by adding the uncertainty to the average value of the distance modulus and putting this new value into the magnitude distance formula. That gives a maximum possible distance. You can also calculate a minimum distance by subtracting the uncertainty from the average distance modulus and using that to calculate a distance. Subtract the minimum distance from the maximum and divide this result by 2 to get the uncertainty in distance, and then fill in the summary of your results. 
As we mentioned earlier, the very brightest stars probably won't be present in your star cluster's main sequence because they've already gotten to the end of their main sequence lives. The older the cluster is, the more stars have left the main sequence, so the lower and redder the top end of the main sequence gets. We can use this idea to get an estimate of the age of the cluster. The lab includes a link to a simulation from Northwestern University that shows how a cluster HR diagram evolves over time. When you play the simulation, you see that the main sequence gets shorter and the top end gets redder. You can't directly compare the magnitudes on the vertical axis with the ones on your graph because the data in the simulation is in absolute magnitudes, not apparent. However, you can directly compare the colors. Find the B minus B value that corresponds with the highest and bluest part of your cluster's main sequence. Then follow the simulation and see when the high end of the cluster's main sequence reaches the same B minus V value. You may have to adjust the time manually on the simulation to get the closest possible value. Then you can read off the age from the top of the window. Note that MYR on the time means millions of years. The second half of this lab is an exploration experiment. Once again, don't be fooled by the fact that you're not seeing detailed instructions here. In an exploration experiment, you have to develop the procedure. This part is as much or more work as the part we've done, so give it the time it needs. The goal here is for you to apply the techniques you've developed in this lab to a question that you can explore yourself. You're welcome to come up with your own exploration experiment. But if you do, you should probably check it with your instructor to make sure it's doable with the tools you've got. If you don't have your own suggestion, we've listed a couple here. The first option asks you to look at the stars in the cluster that appear to not be part of the main sequence and decide if they really are non-main sequence stars that are in the cluster or stars that aren't part of the cluster at all, but instead are in front of or behind it. Within the spreadsheet, note that there are links for each star to its Simbad database entry, where you can find more specific information on that star, including the spectral luminosity class and parallax. The second option asks you to look at some of the other parts of the spectrum besides the B and V bands. In particular, look at the infrared and or ultraviolet columns and see if you're seeing signs of stars that are unusually bright in one or the other of these. You might, for example, subtract the U column from the V column and see what that gives you. Can you suggest ideas on why that might be? Again, you can use the Simbad links to find out more information about these stars to test your hypothesis. Whether you pick one of the options we suggest or come up with one of your own, You'll need to do a write-up that includes your question and a hypothesis that states what you expect and why. Then you'll need to describe all the steps you take. This should be the sort of detailed, step-by-step -step description that would allow someone else to duplicate your work. Your write-up should also include all the data you take, including any graphs or histograms you create to test your hypothesis. Finally, Include your conclusions, where you discuss whether your data supported your hypothesis or not, and what went right and wrong in your exploration experiment. 